Good evening. Welcome to the Monday, July 28th, 2014 Washougal City Council meeting. I would ask that you all please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the Monday, July 28th, 2014 Washougal City Council just previous to this meeting, we did have a uh, workshop meeting of the council. Uh, some of the topics that we discussed there this evening, we had uh, some updates from the Regional Transportation Commission. Uh, we talked about some recreational marijuana code changes that uh, we've got an item on the agenda uh, to set a public hearing for our next council meeting on. We also talked about a fire and EMS uh, levy lid lift for the November ballot possibly a public safety levy lid lift for the November ballot as well, and then also had some discussions on a transportation benefit district. And that brings us to this meeting here this evening. Rose, could you call the roll, please? Councilmember Boger? Here. Councilmember Wagner? Here. Councilmember Greenlee? Here. Councilmember Lindsay? Here. Councilmember McDaniel? Councilmember Shoemaker? Here. Councilmember Freeman? Here. Thank you. Councilmember McDaniel did indicate that she would not be here this evening and asked to be excused. Mr. Mayor, I ask unanimous consent that Councilmember McDaniel be excused. There are no objections so ordered. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Okay, seeing none, our first order of business, we have a presentation from, uh, from the Camas Police Department. Chief Lackey, welcome. So I think uh, Chief Mitchell is going to ask uh, Officer Day to come in with his canine partner, Ranger. Here they come. <laughs> so uh, I asked Chief Mitchell just if I could take a, a few minutes of your time tonight to recognize uh, Officer Day and Ranger. And on July 7th, or July 7th, July 2nd, we had an armed robbery in Camas you know, where a person went into the 7 market down by the one stop and assaulted the clerk. Uh, we, the person actually fled, and the car was quickly located down at the port. Uh, we do not have a canine dog, but uh, Chief Mitchell has always offered the services of Ranger whenever we needed him, and so uh, we did summon for the dog, and, and Kyle responded quickly and brought him down. So it, my story might just be a pretty typical police dog story, except for one thing, and that is as soon as uh, Kyle uh, had the dog circle the car of the suspect and they took off on a run directly across the parking lot of the port over towards a big blue dumpster. And the dog circled the dumpster for a minute and then pulling uh, Officer Day is behind him on the rope. Uh, as soon as, and they disappeared down by the riverbank. And as soon as that happened, within about five seconds, I got tapped on the shoulder by an employee of the Port of Camas, Washougal, and he said, hey, I want to introduce myself. I'm the IT manager here at the port, and our video system caught the suspect when he parked in and left his car. And I said, well, do you see where he went? And the person said, yeah. He went across the parking lot diagonally, right over by that blue dumpster, circled it twice, and went down by the riverbank. So, well, that was exactly the path that Ranger had traveled on. And so I want to tell you that this dog is very good at what he does. Um, and so because of that, I have a chief's challenge coin that I would like to reward him. Now, a challenge coin uh, for performance is something that in our office, not every officer has even earned. They're only earned for exceptional performance. And so we had to have one modified, so it would uh, clip on Ranger's collar. But Officer Day, I'm going to go ahead and let you pin that on there. <laughs> <laughs> Chief Lackey, maybe this is a challenge. You should pin it on him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm smarter than that. Okay. And even though this guy did all the hard work, I have one for his partner, too. Thank you very much. Uh, to Chief Mitchell, Officer Day, and the whole City Council, thank you very much for the services that you help us with over in the City of Camas. It, uh, it goes both ways, no doubt about it. Kyle, Chief? Uh, we did actually end up locating, 
Kyle, thanks for bringing him down. Thank you very much. Chief, thank you. Thank you. Appreciated. With that, it brings us to the first opportunity in our agenda this evening for public comments. Any member of the public that would like to comment to council? I know it looks like a lot of you are probably here for our annexation discussions this evening, and like we did last time when this came up, uh, if you've got comments in regard to the annexations and can stay for that portion of the discussion, we'll ask for those comments during that time rather than now. But if you need to leave earlier and want to make those ahead of time, you certainly can. So, Harvey, I see you, yeah. I see you moving already. Well, I can't be here in the next two or three meetings, Mayor, probably not. And excuse my speech impediment, I've had major mouth surgery here a week and a half ago. Uh, Mayor Guard, Councilors, my name is Harvey Olson, 3903 R Street. I wish to thank our newest council member, Michelle Wagner, for her service to the citizens of the United States and now her willingness to serve the citizens in the Washougal. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now to a subject of extensive newspaper coverage, marijuana dispensaries. It is a violation of current federal law to grow or possess, sell marijuana. I again ask the council to continue the moratorium, which is coming up next month, on how the, cit the city should proceed concerning this issue and expand the current ordinance to include, quote, business licenses will be issued only if city, county, state, or federal laws will not be violated. Clark County and several Washington State cities currently have this wording in place. The United States Attorney General has enacted a policy of limiting the Fed's involvement in enforcing the above stated law regarding marijuana. This policy has been put in place by an unelected official, not the United States Congress. When the voters of Washington approved the sale and possession of marijuana, Washougal voters rejected it. The Washington State Attorney General has stated his opinion that our cities are not obligated to establish retail stores to sell the drug simply because this law was passed. I repeat an earlier statement I made to the Council on June 23rd of this year, quote, a policy can change over a cup of coffee. A federal law can only be changed, modified, or repealed by the United States Congress. <clears throat> Which one do you consider best for Washougal? A federal policy enacted by the U.S. Attorney General, an unelected official, or a federal law passed by the United States Congress? I thank you for your time. Thank you, Harvey. Anyone else that would like to comment to Council? Good evening, Marilyn. Uh, 
Welcome, Ms. Wagner. Thank you. I'm Marilyn Terrell, and I live at, at 950G Street. You all have a copy of my comments here. Do you want me to read this through? Uh, totally up to you, Marilyn. You can if you'd like, but we certainly have it as part of the record already as well. Okay, well, I, I think I'd like to because I would like it on the record doubly. Um, recently, we read the results of review, review of citizens' judgment of the performance level of city services. The report stated that 42% of residents felt that code enforcement was a problem. Had I and several of my neighbors been included in that survey, the percentage would have been higher. Code enforcement has done little or nothing for the residents of G Street. And um, for the rest of you, G Street that I'm referring to is between E Street and 12th. We have seen code enforcement truck drive th through our street. Apparently the driver did not note the many lawns full of tall weeds and the junk cards sitting, sitting out rotting in public. Then there are the cars permanently parked on lawns. There's not one property on G Street from E Street to 12th Avenue that does not have sufficient space to park at least two or even more cars, but lawn parking is apparently allowed even though it is supposed to be against code. I had visitors recently from a similarly old town in Ontario. I was embarrassed by what they saw. It is my understanding that code enforcement is complaint driven. That means that property owners are supposed to tattle on their neighbors if they want them to do what they should be doing without being driven to it. I should add that having checked on the ownership of the houses on this portion of G Street, about 40% are owned by people living out of town. What do they care if the street is a mess? Should not the city have the right to ask them to see that the income they get from their renters needs to be filtered through some responsible behavior? And if complaining neighbors are unlucky, Ms. Montgomery will tell the offending property owner the name of the complainant. I think this is a poor system and needs to be changed. Long ago when we were kids, we were told it is not nice to be a tattletale. So what are we to do? Not too long ago, Washougal put a lot of money into giving us an E Street of which we can be proud. We have a nice smooth roadway and planters along a street lined with a bunch of dumpy properties, many of which I would hope never to be found in. Is that what you expected our money to do? Does any one of those property owners ever pick up the junk from the beds in front of their homes or do some necessary weeding? Has anyone suggested that the folks who live near these plantings might, just might, go out and take some pride in the place in front of their homes? We need some adopt your street groups. Washougal has such a great history and so much to offer. Why should it be a dumpy old town? Down the street from my house at 780, Trevor, having just achieved his chiropractic degree, moved into his uncle's old home. He fixed it up, cut the grass, planted flowers. This residence is across the street from another dump. Opening his practice, he hung up his nice sign on his fence. Sherry Montgomery made him take it down, even though that portion of G Street is zoned commercial residential, and while this new, nicely cared for home faced the dumpy property. This is not fair. Code enforcement should be applied to properties, all the properties which fail to meet the city's standard, which means you've got to get another person. This is my home. I really like living here, but I don't think the city appreciates just how much change we need. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Marilyn. Anyone else that would like to address council? Okay, not your only opportunity. There is another opportunity before the end of the agenda uh, this evening. Uh, council, that moves us to your consent agenda this evening. It is comprised of four items. Your workshop minutes of July 14th, 2014. Your council minutes of July 14th, 2014. <coughs> Your regular accounts payable claims in the amount of $721,287.17. And also Agenda Bill 47-14, an Agenda Bill to set a public hearing on Marijuana Code amendments. Did you pull item D? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm sorry, which one? D, the last one. Uh, I'd like to pull item C. 
so I ask unanimous consent that we approve the consent agenda items A and B as read. Very no objection, so ordered. Uh, Dave, do you want to take payroll claims or uh, vouchers? I, I, I just have a, a comment to make. One of these vouchers is a reimbursement to me, and so I wanted to point that out before we vote on it. That's all. I move that we approve the regular AP claims as described in the consent agenda. Second. I've got a motion and a second to approve the uh, <clears throat> Voucher claims. Any council discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <coughs> Brings us to Agenda Bill 47 14, setting a public hearing regarding marijuana code amendments. Mitch? Well, no, I actually I have just a comment too, just explaining my vote on this. I don't think we need another presentation on it since we're going to get one in two weeks anyway, unless the council would like one. Uh, I'm going to support this. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, tonight's the last night. If we were going to put an advisory vote on the ballot, which I've advocated in the past, basically tonight would be the last regular council night we can do that. Um, I'm going to support this because I think we need a year and a half, or a little less than a year and a half, as, as it turns out, to evaluate where things are going to go at the federal level and with the state legislature and what the experience is with uh, legal marijuana in other, other cities. Um, so uh, I think it's appropriate to have the voters actually look at all that uh, in another advisory measure, which I will ask for next year. With that, I'll move for approval. Second. second. I've got a motion and a second to approve the uh, setting a public hearing to take testimony on August 11th, 2014 at 7 p.m. on proposed amendments to prohibit medical marijuana collective gardens and recreational marijuana producers, processors, and retailers. Any council questions or comments? Again, this isn't to ban it. This is just setting the public hearing. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Brings us to Agenda Bill 48-14, Emergency Utility Assistance Program. Dave? Thank you, Mayor. Council, before you is uh, an expenditure for utility assistance program payments uh, in the amount of $227.99. Um, the um, applications for assistance were reviewed by staff and by the Finance Committee and approved and pursuant to uh, the, the program policies, they are before you for your final approval. Council? Mr. Mayor, I move that we authorize the transfer of funds from the Utility Assistance Program Fund to the Consumer's Utility Account as approved by the Finance Committee. Second. I've got a motion and a second to authorize the transfer of funds from the Utility Assistance Program Fund to the Customer's Utility Accounts as approved by the Finance Committee. Any council discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Could we have a roll call, please? Councilmember Boger? Aye. Councilmember Wagner? Aye. Councilmember Greenlee? Aye. Councilmember Lindsay? Aye. Councilmember Shoemaker? No. Councilmember Freeman? No. The motion is approved. Thank you. Brings us to Agenda Bill 49 14, a resolution to rescind resolutions number 933 and number 937 regarding annexation procedures. Mitch? Thank you, Your Honor. As staff, Thank you, Your Honor. As staff previously discussed uh, with Council, we have two resolutions uh, currently <coughs> adopted that create inconsistencies with regards to procedures uh, and annexations. Uh, we, I had initially thought of just uh, rescinding those as a motion, but <coughs> I drafted a uh, resolution that is before you now that is, takes formal action to rescind both of those ordinances. They are inconsistent with state law. And our code already has requirements for annexation, so the resolutions are really not needed. Uh, so therefore, the recommended action is to read the resolution by title only and pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Mr. Mayor, I ask unanimous consent that we read the resolution by title only. Hearing no objection, so ordered. A resolution rescinding resolution 933 and resolution 937. 
Mr. Mayor, I move that we pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Second. I've got a motion and a second to pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Any council discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. That brings us to Agenda Bill 50-14, Annexations. Excuse me, we've discussed uh, the uh, annexations previously at workshops on April 28th, June 23rd, and July 14th. Uh, tonight is the, the meeting that Council needs to take action about moving forward with regard to the proposed annexations. We have six separate petitions for annexation uh, in front of us. They are all within the northwest corner of our urban growth boundary, and they contain uh, or comprise three different zoning designations and totaling approximately 150 acres. Uh, the City of Washougal utilizes the direct, direct petition method under RCW 35A14. For a notice of intent to commence annexation, which, as I mentioned, we have six, ten, uh, property owners representing 10 percent of the assessed value of that property uh, need to be submitted. Obviously, we have 100 percent of those six properties that have been submitted. For a petition for annexation uh, to move forward, you have to have 60% of the uh, property owners representing 60% of the assessed value of that property in order to be annexed. That's, that 60% is important to remember when we get to, forward to the uh, options that are before you. So in looking at the city of Washougal, as I mentioned, we're, uh, the property that we're looking at annexing is in the northwest portion of the city. Uh, zooming in a little bit further, and then this uh, represents uh, the petitioners, those that have signed a petition for intent to commence annexation. RCW 305A14120, it requires council, you need to either accept, reject, or geographically modify the annexation area. You can require the simultaneous adoption of a proposed zoning regulation, although I have mentioned before uh, that we don't have the employment center designation. Staff would need to go back to Planning Commission, develop those regulations, and bring those back to you for approval uh, prior to the hearing on the annexation. And Council can require the assumption of all or any portion of existing city indebtedness by the area to be annexed. As I mentioned, uh, initially we thought that there wasn't any indebtedness. However, we have the public safety bond that would, um, that indebtedness would be assigned to that area as well. And so as part of your action, you have to make the determination of whether that would apply. And that is staff's recommendation that you do so. Um, we'll go, go over the modification options. These were the staff put together. Uh, they're in your agenda bill along with the data that uh, shows the, those that are in favor and against or, or no comment. Um, option one, uh, it's approximately about a hunt would be 190 acres. There's 30 parcels involved uh, there. And option two, uh, just a little bit smaller, 185 acres, uh, about 26 parcels there that are involved with that. And then last is option three, which is the largest, 230 acres, and consists of 33 parcels. You recall. Uh, staff reached out to uh, neighbors within the area uh, uh, several times to gauge their input on uh, the idea of being annexed. Uh, this map uh, graphically represents uh, the opinions that we found, uh, the red are opposed. Uh, yellow are in favor but did not sign a petition, but they are in favor of annexation. Uh, green, again, are the petitioners who have uh, filed the intent. And then blue is no response. Uh, we didn't receive a response from uh, those parties. So looking at the options uh, with that uh, neighborhood input, first one is option one, again, 190 acres. Uh, you have, in that, you have seven parcels that would be opposed to that annexation. It's important to note the percentage down there, the 57.34, that is the percentage if everything now, including the blue, were no's, that that would be the percentage uh, of those property owners in favor representing their, their percentage of assessed value. 
therefore you wouldn't meet the 60 percent and that one moving forward would have little hope of passing. Option two, uh, again 185 acres. Uh, this, as you can see, 73.33 percent. Uh, you have four property owners in that one that would be opposed. Uh, this is the one that staff is recommending to council that you modify the boundary to. Uh, the last is, again, uh, option three, 230 acres. Uh, this is a little bit of a change. When we originally gave these numbers, we didn't have uh, one of the petitioners that were, in, not, excuse me, petitioners, but property owners that were uh, uh, no response, but they have since said they were in favor, which bumped it over to the, the 60 percent. So as I mentioned earlier, that is, a, is an option that is before you, uh, although there are nine property owners then, uh, so more property owners than that that would be opposed to the annexation. And again, staff's recommendation is to look at the option two. So next steps, um, staff will work with petitioners based on city council's action this evening. Uh, staff will, again, develop the Employment Center regulations for Planning Commission recommendation and ultimately for your approval. And staff will develop the petition for annexation for petitioners, which will be back to City Council later in the year for the hearing. So as I mentioned, the recommended action that staff, uh, staff is recommending the action that you take is to geographically modify the proposed annexation area to that identified in Exhibit B require the assumption of all existing city indebtedness by the area to be annexed and authorize staff to develop a petition for annexation for the area and authorize its circulation. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, so before we go to council, I want to open the floor to uh, folks in the audience who would like to speak to the annexation question itself. Anybody that would like to comment, please come up to the microphone. Give us your name and address. And please try and limit your comments to three minutes. Anyone at all? Sure. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dave Zapponi, and I'm the blue in between the red there. So, uh, so two. My uh, name is Dave Zapponi. My address is 2903 Southeast uh, 282nd Court. And I just want to make that's where we are the dot, and uh, we would oppose the uh, uh, petition. Just want to make sure that was on the record. Okay. Thank you. Does that change the uh, 73 point? Does not. The percentages uh, assumed assume that they were no. Okay. Uh, can we get Mr. Zapponi to share with us the reasons for his opposition? Sure. Uh, again, Dave Zapponi, uh, 2903 Southeast uh, 282nd Court. Uh, answer, Mr. Shoemaker. Um, the reasons for our opposition to it is a couple. Uh, one, we, we, we enjoy living in the county. So I think, first of all, we prefer to be in the county than the city. Second of all, um, the freedoms of being in the county follow our lifestyle and we moved into the area. Uh, the other is I think uh, we didn't want to have the uh, additional burden that we would have, the safety uh, bond and what, or whatever the additional taxes are. So there's a few reasons why we would oppose. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to comment to council? Did, did Mitch show the one up to the left by the yellow? Mitch, <laughs> is that what you highlighted? Because there's three blues, I want to make sure. Okay. Thank you. Chief, good evening. Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, Scott Kohler, Fire Chief, East County Fire and Rescue. Um, <clears throat> we talked at the workshop, but uh, we were asked to come back to the, uh, uh, the full council meeting. And I just want to talk for a couple of minutes about uh, the impact of annexation on the fire district. Uh, currently, under the way that uh, the fire departments work in this area, East County Fire and Rescue is the first responder to that northwest corner of uh, 23rd and Crown, so the elementary school. Uh, the computer puts us as first due, uh, and that's because we are the fastest responder to that area. 
and uh, all fire agencies in the county have agreed that on any kind of life-threatening medical or any serious uh, property-threatening fire, closest unit will go regardless of jurisdiction. Um, so uh, we currently service the Woodburn Elementary School, which is in the city of Camas. And if you annex the area there uh, around 23rd and Crown, we will be first in, uh, first responders to the area on 23rd. Um, I think you understand that if you go from a rural designation with, uh, you know, a small number of houses per acre to, uh, a, a, well, a, a single house per several acres, and then you go to a city designation where you add several houses per acre, uh, there'd be a significant increase in the potential call volume to that area. Um, over the course of developing this area, uh, it presents a pretty large growth in potential call volume uh, to East County Fire. And while we have the capacity to cover that, uh, each time we respond into the city, those are costs that our taxpayers bear. And so uh, while we do not dispute the city's, uh, you know, ability or, or uh, authority to annex, what we would ask is that you consider the growing cost of auto aid and mutual aid to that area. And uh, the fire district would like to discuss with the city the options that exist to mitigate the cost for um, what would be anticipated as response into this area. Um, we, we just think it would be fair for our taxpayers to be considered uh, in the discussion. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to make comment? Good evening, Larry. Larry Landgraver. Um, we are at 29513 Southeast 33rd, which is, we are in the city, but I'm just, my daughter has a piece of property just north of us, which is just right above that little, there you go. Um, and my question is this, if you decide to adopt a plan for annexation, does it include all the properties on here? Is there any, will you leave any of them out or is it just gonna be all or nothing? What's the? Depends, Larry, on which, uh, which, which option the council should choose to go for, if any of them. I think, um, I think, yeah, I think she's in all three. She, I believe she is, yes. Yeah, so, okay, so it would then be. It would include that property itself, okay. yes. All right, well, thank you. You bet. Good evening, Ellen. Um, Ellen Doyle, 28606 Southeast 30th Circle. And I just wanted to point out, I don't know if it'll uh, make a difference on your numbers, but one of the properties uh, right next to this Bonies in the yellow is in transition. It was just sold. So I don't know if that new property owner would vote would be different than what the current owner is. Something to be noted. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else that would like to comment? Okay, with that, I will open the uh, question to council. Paul? Mitch, would you describe the, the landform in the upper <clears throat> left there, the northwest corner that's mostly red? Is that, is a lot of verticality to it? Is it smooth or what? High point, high point is in this location, and then it starts dropping down as you move to the north. So, it's, so it's, it's really not suitable for Prune Hill kind of industrial development? I wouldn't necessarily say that because we get in development on um, hillsides. I think it's... Uh, well, I meant uh, industrial development. Yeah, not, not, in, not industrial, but a business park type. Uh, development. Um, I, I'm trying to think of the one in Camas that's on a pretty good hillside as well. Um, it doesn't preclude it. Does it create challenges? Yes. But it doesn't preclude that type of development, in my opinion. Thank you. Dave? Is not the fire coverage uh, for that area uh, under a, an agreement, a cooperative agreement? Uh, between Camus and Eckfer at this time? Just, just Property right now is covered by East County Fire and Rescue. Solely. The, the ambulance it, services are covered through the interlocal agreement. Camus uh, provides okay. ambulance services for all three agencies. But for fire and then that immediate first response, it's in the... Okay. Uh, so then the follow-up question would be, is there any, are there any plans 
uh, for such discussions because I think some of the the uh, issues that Chief Kohler has, has raised uh, deserve our attention. And of course, that means the attention of Camus. I can't answer for Camus on that. Yeah. I don't know. There certainly in our uh, previous to our consolidation in the long-term plans, there were uh, discussions multiple times on a station to be located out towards this same area. Is it possible for us to beseech Camus on Eckford's behalf for these discussions? Well, I think they already have an ongoing discussion with, with the city of Camus on those. Regardless, um, this isn't the first time that issue has come up. I understand the uh, discussion in regards to the number of times that one agency or another may be tapped out into another agency's area. At the same time, there are high percentages in many cases of those calls immediately being canceled out as well. In this, in this regard, it's no different than if East County's closest unit is already tied up, Camus is going to get called to cover this area, its closest unit. That's, I don't know that we would find too many people other than budget riders that would have any problem with the closest unit, whether it's police, fire, or EMS getting called to a particular location. You want help and you want it right now, regardless what's on it. I think it would behoove us to ask Camus to sit down with Eckfer on this, on this issue. Talking about an issue like this never hurts and often helps. And I understand that sometimes they're canceled out and, and sometimes they're not. Gary, are you already in discussions with Camus on these particular ones? Gary Larson? We could certainly make that request. I would be ever so grateful. Thank you. Good. Other <coughs> council questions, comments? Connie Joe? So based on the testimony of the house being sold, Mitch, can you answer that question? As to whether that would affect this action tonight? I'd, at 73%, I don't believe that it does change. It, I don't believe it drops it below the 60%. I mean, I could... Um, you know, I could pull up the spreadsheet, put the number in, and, and figure it out exactly. But I, I believe that that's a, that it's a pretty significant um, shift in order to get below the 60%. I think we are still safe. Then, again, on option three, you're probably below the 60%, which takes that one off the table. If they're opposed. Do you know if, if they are opposed, yes. Do you know if the, it's closed escrow and they're truly owners at this point? And they're not here this evening. I don't think so. well. Mitch, do I read this correctly that even once you add the public safety bond, that the tax rate in the city is lower than it is in the county? That is correct. In this portion, the mill rate is lower. Thank you. Brent? Um, what <coughs> compelling reason do we have other than geographic compactness do we have to? Um, uh, bring these unwilling property owners into the city? Well, um, there's a couple of things. One, um, I think uh, Mayor Gard pointed this out the last time, that access for these three properties here are all run right through here. And so <coughs> responders would be going through county, through the city to get to the county again. Uh, that was one reason that we looked at why these uh, we should bring those in not to mention it's a nice line coming down looking over here um, you have basically you would end up with uh, a jack-o-lantern uh, look um, regarding those moving around those properties and, and I said this in my agenda bill uh, but I think it's important to note that th these properties are within our, our urban growth boundary um, which is our urban growth boundary right now uh, looking at the next 20 years. Uh, as part of the update uh, that we're working with on the county for adoption in 2016, we didn't ask for any expansion of our urban growth boundary, so we're keeping this same one. Um, the fact is, is that 
it is highly likely that all of these properties within this area will someday be within the city of Washougal. And so um, it, the, to not have that nice boundary like that, either we leave two people out that didn't petition and draw the line below, or we look at bringing those people in and making a, a, a more distinct boundary there. It's also, I'd like to mention too, um, in your presentation, uh, and I can get there in just a second, is the zoning boundary, which is another reason why I looked at drawing that line right there. This to the north being the employment and the residential to the south. Well, uh, could you go back to the other? Absolutely. If that one of those yellows flips, the one that's for um, that's going through us, going through sale right now, we're down to just one property owner in that area that wants in the city. Correct. And we're making the others two. come in. Is it? Is it two? Well, you've got three yellows now. I can't see the lines close clearly enough. I'm I'm, I'm talking I, about the. You're two. just looking in this area, right? Yeah, here. that area yeah. right there. Yeah. So if this one went red, then you would only have this one that would. Yeah, I have a, you know, I have a problem with bringing in all those people when only one property owner in that area that we know of for sure wants in. Well, and uh, let me go back to, I'm sorry, go back to option. So that's the boundary that, that staff is recommending. So again, we're only looking at these. Two no, know, one yes. Two no. Decided. Yeah, we're, this is not in. I mean, that wouldn't be in the, in the area. It would just be these two that we'd be bringing in in this area. Okay, I can go over that. Other council discussion? Do we have a motion? Well, I move, I, I don't know what the form of the motion, I, I can't find the form of the motion here. Uh, but basically what I would like to, to move is that we accept uh, option B or option two, uh, and uh, and move forward with the annexation. What what's the language I need there? You've got all three of them right there. Yeah, it's on the on the last page of the agenda bill. Do you not have that? Recommended actions. Oh, okay. So, I would move that we modify the proposed an annexation area that identified in Exhibit B, that we require the assumption of all or any portion of existing city indebtedness by the area to be annexed, and that we authorize the staff to develop a petition for annexation for the area and authorize its circulation. Second. I've got a motion in a second to geographically modify the proposed annexation area to that identified in Exhibit B, option two require the assumption of all or any portion of existing city indebtedness by the area to be annexed and authorize the staff to develop a petition for annexation for the area and authorize its circulation. Any council discussion? Dave? Do I understand correctly on the issue of the indebtedness to be assumed that it is from this day forward? No. No. You're an this, this doesn't annex anybody. This just moves the process forward. And from the approval of the annexation uh, forward as opposed to payments that were due in the past on this bond? No, just, yeah, just from that, that point in time once the property is annexed, not Thank for you. anything up to this point. Thank you. Any other council discussion? Yep. All those members in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. That brings us to Agenda Bill 51-14, a resolution in regards to Levy Lidliff for fire and EMS. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, before you is a resolution that would forward to the voters a proposition for a uh, renewal of a 10 cents per $1,000 of assessed valuation Levy Lidlift, uh, which would be replacing a similar Lidlift that was in place from 2007 to 2012. So 
We're calling this a replacement uh, levy lid lift. Uh, this would be on the November 4th, 2014 general election ballot. The purpose of the lid lift would be precisely for fire and emergency medical services. Uh, and upon its passage, the rate that would be our tax rate would be 10 cents higher than it would otherwise be if it did not pass. The exact rate won't be known until later in the year. In the resolution, there is a placeholder rate, but it will never be more than 10 cents higher than uh, what it would have been without this lift. So the recommended action is to read the resolution by title only and to pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Mr. Mayor, I ask unanimous consent that we read the resolution by title only. There ain't no objection so ordered. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Washougal providing for the submission to the qualified voters of the city at their regular municipal general election to be held therein on November 4, 2014 of a proposition authorizing the city to increase its regular property tax levy above the limit established in Chapter 84.55.010 RCW for six years to provide funds for fire and emergency medical services and requesting the Clark County Auditor to place the proposition on such general municipal election ballot. Mr. Mayor, I move that we pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Is there a second? Second. second. I've got a motion and a second to pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Any council discussion? If I, if I could, I just want to un have you underline one thing for me. This is for what purpose? Fire and emergency medical services. Can it be used for anything else? No. Do we have to separately account for it? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Any other council discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Brings us to Agenda Bill 52-14, a resolution to forward to the voters a proposition for a levy lid lift to support public safety services. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, this item is for an additional levy lid lift, uh, similar to the one that you just acted on. This would be for 10 cents per $1,000 of assessed valuation for six years. Uh, in this case, the purpose would be for public safety services. And we would have to, in line with that, the, those questions, um, we would have to separately account these funds and they could only be used for public safety services. Um, the ballot title uh, acknowledges public <coughs> safety services. It is the intent of the council, as I understand it, that the primary use of those funds would be for the addition of a police officer. And that is expressed very clearly in the recitals to the re resolution expressing your legislative intent uh, and that uh, a small portion of the remaining proceeds would be used for other related public safety enhancements. In the case of this uh, levy lid lift, we are dealing with new services and enhanced services in the community in the area of public safety, whereas the replacement levy lid lift that you just uh, placed on the ballot is to maintain the current level of fire and emergency medical services and is a replacement. This would be new uh, and it would be for enhanced services. The recommended action this evening is to read the resolution by title only and then to pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Mr. Mayor, I ask unanimous consent that we read the resolution by title only. Hearing no objection, so ordered. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Washougal providing for the submission to the qualified voters of the city at the regular municipal general election to be held therein on November 4, 2014 of a proposition authorizing the city to increase its regular property tax levy above the limit established in Chapter 84.55.010 RCW for six years to provide funds for public safety services and requesting the Clark County Auditor to place the proposition on such general municipal election ballot. Mr. Mayor, I move that we pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Second. Second. I've got a motion and a second to pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. Um, Council go ahead, discussion? Paul. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not going to support this. Um, I believe it 
just, it jeopardizes the fire and EMS levy, which we really need. Not that we don't need uh, public safety, uh, more public safety dollars, but I think there are better ways to do this. And um, I think if we're going to do a second uh, a levy, I would suggest doing it for streets because I'm not going to support car tabs either when that issue comes up. So I'll be voting no. I joke about it and say I, I'm the longest serving council member here and my kind of standing joke is that if I had known I was going to have to be the institutional memory, I would have paid much closer attention. But as long as I can remember, the Washougal Police Department has been one or two officers fewer than its manning table. At this point in time, our police department answers more calls per officer than any other force in Clark County. That's an unsustainable burden, and we really need to find a way to pay for another officer. This lid lift will do that. It will give us one more officer. We probably need three but it will give us one more, which we desperately need. So I think this is, this is a good thing. So one correction, I'm sure that we don't respond to more calls than any other agency in the county. Our officer call ratio is high. Yeah, per we officer. We certainly don't, on an agency basis, respond to more than anybody else. No ratio. Other council. David? This is a, uh, a council initiative, and it was undertaken for two reasons. One. We're wearing out our police force very rapidly with the staffing that we've got. And secondly, there are times when we don't have appropriate backup for the officers at night. This uh, is our way of solving that problem. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, um, would it be appropriate to hear from the chief of police? I was just going to ask the chief on that last I one because that's news to me that we don't have appropriate backup. Would you have him come to the mic? Uh, quite often at night we're down to two officers um, and, and those are the times when that's just that is our minimum requirements we cannot stop less than, t than two officers so uh, just and it's also a time when we get some uh, the nature of the calls changes to where the you need that second or that, that extra third body there so uh, to say that it's there's no backup, it's just there's, it's not at the level that we would like to see it that we're used to, to dealing with uh, during the daytime. time. And, and, and at night, it's, it's much more complicated with the cover of darkness and, uh, again, the nature of calls that respond to. Generally, if you're getting called out at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, it's pretty serious. <coughs> so um, to have a third body there would be improve our officer safety, yes. We do still have mutual aid with Camus as well in we the do. county. And, and, you know, we recognize that Camus is available to us, but, but that costs oftentimes us money. they're busy as well. So, and then to... Uh, it doesn't cost us anything. Oh, no. All of, all of the agencies within the county are all part of a mutual aid agreement. They call, we go. Okay. You know, and and the, the, the county would be there too, but sometimes they're down to just one person, maybe in the East County car, and if they're out, then there's really no other choices. Would you... Uh, name? Uh, there's been statements that you would say your force is getting worn out, and um, is that accurate? Well, it's accurate to the point where you can only work so much overtime, and you can only work long hours. Um, right now, we're pretty much running 12-hour um, shifts, and sometimes the 12s turn into 13s. Uh, our, our regular staffing is 11 hours uh, per shift, but right now, just to, to make ends meet, we're running 12 hours pretty much all the time. Uh, and then that gets compounded if there's somebody sick or on vacation or, or injured. And it's, it's just real difficult. We're just at the point where uh, the, the call volume is such, and not only it's not so much the, the increase in calls, but it's the nature of the calls that are requiring multiple officers to respond. So whereas, uh, you know, a shoplifting call can be handled pretty much by, by one officer most of the time. <laughs> Uh, but when you're dealing with uh, mental health issues and suicidal uh, people uh, and uh, violent crimes, assault, it's, 
it's taking maybe everybody that's on duty and then it's, it might take an hour and a half, two hours to unwind that call. So that's what we're seeing now. And I, I, I can look back uh, to five or six years ago, our, our call volume was less. We had more officers, but we weren't seeing the, the degree of, of complex calls that we're dealing with now that just it, it's just difficult to stay on board with everything. I'm, could I just wrap up? I'm actually, you're kind of moving me into the abstention category now because um, one of the problems I have with this is this is only, hasn't been discussed for even a, a week, uh, right? And when was this brought up? It was brought up at the? It was brought to my attention on uh, a week ago from Friday. That's not to say that we haven't been discussing it we've at been, our budget we've, committee we've meetings. Yeah. And we have discussed it at the safety Early. committee. And as Dave mentioned, we approached the chief and asked, because I've been on the Public Safety Committee for two and a half years now, and I've been aware of the shortfall all this time. Well, I've been aware of it, but I, what I meant to say is that we haven't discussed a levy lid lift as a vehicle to deal with this. I haven't heard that before. That's My, new. Yeah, that's new, and uh, I would just like a little more time to think about it. Now, we don't have a lot of time. Um, but um, the chief's comments have moved me at least into the abstention category now. Mayor. Michelle. I just, um, would having an additional officer mean that there would be three on-call officers then available um, in any given period <coughs> throughout the day? Or is that just for certain periods? <coughs> it just depends on how we move things over, but that would certainly give us <coughs> An extra officer during the evening <coughs> that would come on probably at least till uh, three thirty, four o'clock in the morning. So you mentioned to me, I believe, before that there's two officers on patrol at any given time throughout there's, the day. Yeah, we have to. Our, our minimum requirements are two officers, twenty four seven. Uh, there's times, most of the time of the day, side so we're running three, and we generally can run three up until about uh, midnight. It's midnight to six is where it's we're vulnerable. And then again, those times are are often uh, <coughs> times where it ties up a lot of our resources for more serious calls. So you feel that it could provide for a six-hour period in the evening, possibly a third. Yeah, it would awesome. definitely en enhance our ability to provide coverage in the uh, early morning hours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If I if I could just make one comment I think it's important to note and I think there's a lot of credit to our current uh, force we are <coughs> we are down two officers active officers right now as we speak and have been for several months uh, and so the current situation is that two of our budgeted positions are not filled by anyone and so we're having to cover those two positions right now and that is certainly exacerbated significantly uh, the increasing call volume that we have been dealing with. Um, we're recruiting for one and hope to have that filled as soon as we possibly can. We don't know what's going to happen with the other position. We're in a, a, a waiting game uh, now, so it could be some months before we uh, are able to fill that or, or, or otherwise deal with that situation. A, an additional officer uh, added to that would then bring us into a situation where a more manageable portfolio would exist because the call volume has increased. Um, but we are too short right now, uh, even out of, out of our budget, and certainly that's exacerbated the situation. I th and it's really a credit to the chief and the, the force for uh, taking care of our community, even in light of those two vacancies to this point. So just to clarify, we're, so we're operating at 17, 17 officers now then? We have two bu budget authority for two more already. Two more sworn. One is tied up in a controversy, right? And then the, uh, the other one is just vacant. It's vacant, and we've uh, recruited, and I think we're down to the home stretch for the chief's yeah. decision. Would that, would that, if we filled those two positions, would that get us the three officers you need in the? It gets back to 19. We were back yeah. to 19. Yeah, but it would, 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 would it alleviate the, e the evening hour concern you have and adequacy of backup? We're still staffing it. It's just with overtime. Oh, okay. 
uh, it just it just gives some t relief. so it's going to cost us less than what an officer normally would cost because we'll be uh, spending less on overtime. Correct. Has that been taken into account in the um, you know if we fill these two positions? We have not uh, done any budgeting uh, to permanently fill those positions with overtime. So we are uh, we are having to accommodate that. We have some salary savings because of you know the vacancies. So I, you know, vacancy. I, want, I want to clarify the overtime when the way we work our schedule. If we have uh, somebody that calls in sick, we just just to save money. We we don't cover that whole 11 hour shift. We'll add maybe two hours, extend somebody an hour on, on each end. So maybe instead of running 11 hours of overtime, we're down to three to four. What if you have a call in the evening that requires say like four officers, how quickly can you get them? You have to call Camus, mm -hmm. Camus. at that point? If, if we need a, uh, something like that goes down, then, then pretty much everybody responds. So we would get everyone from Camus, Sheriff and County. Yeah. Okay. But again, it just depends on what they've got going and uh, their, as far as how quickly they can respond. Certainly, and it's happened before where uh, we've needed uh, coverage and, and uh, Canvas is out of something they just can't leave either. Okay, Joe. It's the budget committee's opinion that if we were to go out and ask, first educate the citizens and ask the citizens they would be the ones to get to decide. If they feel that after hearing the story that they, they can afford, I did the math a little earlier on an average home of 275, it's 1,000, it's $27.50 $27 .50 a year per household. And when, when the community hears that dollar figure and they weigh twenty-seven dollars and fifty cents to having another officer in the night. They can do the decision, make that decision themselves. That's why I'm supporting the opportunity for the citizens to be educated, and then make that decision themselves. They know both that we need fire and that we need police, both. So I think they're very capable. We have a responsibility to communicate well and educate thoroughly on what we've seen up close and personal. They're just hearing it for the first time, but we've been working with this for a long time. Other council discussion? Okay, I've got a motion and a second to pass and post the resolution in the usual manner. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Aye. Motion carries. And just because I don't think it's I think there should have been more discussion on this rather than a, a week. Mr. Mayor, if I could just comment for the council. We'll share some information with you now uh, immediately this week uh, uh, now that we're going to have uh, two propositions on the ballot. There are some um, regulations and requirements that govern how we communicate, uh, how the staff can communicate. It's different than how you can communicate. So we, we will get that information to you so that you're reminded. I think you're all aware of that, but we'll get that information to you so you're reminded about how, how it works when we're dealing with uh, propositions on the ballot. And then uh, we'll come back eventually uh, in, in the right timing to see if there's going to be any committees for or against and all of that. Okay, that brings us to the second opportunity for members of the public to comment to council. Anyone that would like to comment? Good evening. Hi, my name is Karen Harris, and I live on 24th Street. I'm new to the to Washugo, and um, not quite sure I remember the address. So not a worry. <laughs> okay, um, and I didn't bring a copy. I'm sorry. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I would like to talk to you about prejudice. The official definition is a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. We are not born with opinions, preconceived or otherwise. Prejudice is taught. It is embedded within every society and wars are fought today because of it. Less than 100 years ago, my ancestors were taught 
that African Americans were lazy and carried disease. They had to use different toilets, drinking fountains, and schools. They had to sit on the back of the bus and were not allowed to vote. Women were not allowed to vote. They were not as smart as men and couldn't possibly understand man's politics. These were common beliefs not long ago. What prejudice do you hold on to? Have you actually put aside your prejudices and researched marijuana? I would hope as leaders of this community, you can put preconceived opinion aside and educate yourselves. I read your proposal to adopt amendments to Title 18 that would prohibit medical marijuana collective gardens and recreational marijuana producers, processors, and retailers. If I read this correctly, the City Council is using its police powers to ban marijuana in the interest of health, safety, aesthetics, and general welfare of the city. I would like to examine these one at a time. Health. Medical doctors are prescribing marijuana medication to their patients, and the City Council believes that preventing patients from getting their medication locally is in the best interest of the community. If you believe that medical marijuana is a hoax, you might be interested to know that it has been used as medicine since 2700 BC and has many, many uses. It was in the 1920s that it became illegal. In fact, many of our famous ancestors grew cannabis, including George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, and Henry Ford, just to name a few. Safety. I agree that the City Council should take the community safety very seriously. I would also like to share that Denver has had a 10.6% drop in violent and property crimes. Homicides have dropped to less than half, and stolen motor vehicles have shrunk by more than a third. Aesthetics. I would like to read you a quote from a Denver citizen that worried over his property values when marijuana was legalized. Quote, these pot shops have actually turned South Broadway into a nicer area, Johnson says. The shops around the stores have been refurbished and the road has been repaved. The whole shady district of South Broadway is now looking attractive, all because of the money flowing in from the pot shops. If you choose to go out in and patronize them or not, it doesn't matter. It's better looking from the outside, end quote. The last reason stated by the City Council for applying these police powers over marijuana is general welfare. Please put aside your preconceived opinions and look at the truth. Marijuana should not be sent to the back of the bus. I believe the citizens in this community deserve the best and it is your responsibility as leaders of this community to educate yourselves. You're about to prevent your citizens from establishing legal businesses that will employ people. You are about to prevent other businesses in the community from benefiting as they have in Colorado. And lastly, you are keeping badly needed tax dollars out of the community. I ask that you please apply your police, police powers less liberally and lead the community with education instead of fear. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Harvey. Harvey Olson, 3903 R Street. Retired Seattle police officer for 33 years. I have talked to the council probably three, maybe four, possibly even five times <coughs> on the need to have the police department fully staffed to the numbers that it was in 2010 and 11, which was 20. 2012, it was one position was eliminated from the budget and has been ever since. Being two members short right now to get back to 19 requires every officer just to bust their butts out there working for the citizens of Washougal and they do this for the pride that they have in their jobs and to support the chief who is one of the best chiefs in a small town I have ever met in my life. Uh, please give them all the consideration you can. I appreciate it. Uh, 
I know the members of the department will sure appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Harvey. Anyone else that would like to comment, Council? Okay, moving on to Mayor's report, I've got a couple, three items for you. <clears throat> One, uh, just a quick note. Sounds like we had a successful motocross this last uh, this last weekend. Uh, one injury that I know of that came out of it, but as far as uh, police calls within the community and traffic, I heard nothing but uh, but good comments throughout. So, uh, David and I recently had an opportunity to meet uh, Ann Mitch with uh, some of the organizers of our downtown committee, and some of that. Uh, that process is moving forward. David's been able to get them some resources in regards to, uh, to documents and some help from the state level. So uh, you may well see some uh, beginnings of, of that uh, committee going on to a more formal uh, status. There is for your calendars, August 6th, there is a Fort Vancouver library meeting in regards to the Washougal Library. August 6th, 6.30 in the evening, over in the community room. This time it's been canceled. It's been postponed. Okay. <laughs> Disregard that one. Uh, the final items that I have for you are in regards to the appointments committee. Uh, Council members Greenlee and Shoemaker and I met on Friday. Uh, sounds like it was actually a discussion of your budget meeting uh, the week before in regards to uh, filling former council member Polinsky's uh, board roles. The, uh, the recommendations that are coming from the council are on the lodging tax advisory committee. The councilman Shoemaker sit on that committee. In regards to the ad hoc code and policy review committee that nothing be replaced in there for this time on the Community Development Committee that uh, Michelle Wagner take uh, Karen's position on that committee. And I was uncertain when we were done what was happening with finance. I was taking that. <laughs> I'm sorry, my understanding is that Council Member Freeman has volunteered. Okay. By hook or by crook. So those, would, uh, those are in front of you for ratification as council for your council committee. So uh, the only changes would be on finance committee. Uh, Councilman Freeman would sit on that committee. Uh, council member Wagner would sit on community development. And council member Shoemaker would sit on the lodging tax advisory board. Mr. Mayor, I move that we make the, the, those appointments that council member Freeman serve on the finance committee, council member Council Member Wagner on the Community Development Committee and Council Member Shoemaker on the Lodging Tax Advisory Committee. Second. I've got a motion and a second to ratify the uh, committee appointments as put forth. Any council discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Final item is in regard to. Uh, in regard to your budget meetings. I'm going to pass out for council members so that you have them again. The recommendations and the information that came forth from your finance director and city clerk in regards to information from the attorney general's office and municipal research in regards to your meetings and the substance of those meetings. I believe if what council member Greenlee conveyed to me on Friday uh, happened in your last meeting, you have violated the Open Meetings Act. <coughs> I will caution you again that you have information from your city clerk, finance director, based off of the Attorney General's opinion and municipal research that your discussions at those meetings need to be limited to the budget. Only the budget. I implore you if you have questions about that, to please contact Jennifer or our city attorney. Uh, Mr. Mayor, yes. I, I wasn't there. Um, I was working, uh, but one of the questions I had is in what way was the, what, what was, something was discussed that was outside of the budget? Is that the? 
the appointments committee. Uh, basically, the comment was made at uh, the appointments committee meeting that this had been discussed and there was a path forward already. I asked Council Member Greenlee at what meeting it was discussed, and he said the budget meeting. And I asked if they really had a discussion in regards to committee assignments at a budget meeting and was told flatly by Council Member Greenlee that you may talk about anything you care to talk about at those meetings. I'm here to remind you that you may not. Now, at some point, I'm assuming that we might actually get minutes for some of those meetings. If, in fact, it shows what Paul has indicated to me the discussions were, you have violated the state's Open Meetings Act. With all due respect, I think a careful... And, council member, you did so against the advice and the admonishment of your city clerk and finance director and the advice of the attorney general of the state of Washington and municipal research. As staff in administration, we cannot stop you from having discussions that you are going to have. All we can do is continue to remind you when those cross the bounds, when those get close to crossing the bounds, and when in fact you've actually violated <coughs> state codes. Paul? With all due respect, I think if you read RCW, it says that only actions are limited to the agenda for special meetings. I implore you to read the email that you have that says that those meetings are special meetings, Paul. Um, I was Ignorance does not negate the fact that you've got... Actions the under the OPMA also includes discussion. So that's the problem. So, items from council members. Brent? Uh, well, on a happier note, uh, <laughs> we went up to uh, Battleground uh, last week to... Uh, uh, Actually, the mayor and the other mayors, local mayors, uh, conferred on Senator Ann Rivers a well-deserved uh, municipal uh, award. I forget exactly what the award's called. Municipal... Uh, municipal champion. Municipal champion award, and I uh, was very uh, proud of her, and uh, she's come through for us, and I'm very happy to have her as my state senator. Michelle? just been uh, visiting with various city administrators and um, they're just have been learning a whole heck of a lot um, and thank everybody for opening their doors to me and explaining uh, the nuances of what's going on in the city continue to ask as you, as you have questions they're there for you Paul uh, just a heads up there's an RTC meeting the 4th of August for anyone who's interested that's at the county building it starts at 5 o'clock I'm sorry, at, f at 4 o'clock, and it's over promptly at 5.30 because the county commission has to meet in that same space at 6. Uh, those meetings are also available on CVTV. There is a lot of visual aids that are presented in these meetings, and they do show up in the CVTV uh, recaps. Um, in the most recent meeting, there was a demonstration that was done by a previous Secretary of Transportation and in talking about how flow metering actually moves more traffic than just dumping everything onto the system. There's this wonderful little demonstration of that. I commend it to you. It's about 45 minutes into the meeting. Also, the Association of Washington Cities has a city municipal finance and budgeting training course every year in Leavenworth in the middle of August. That training this year is the 13th, 14th, and 15th of August. The 15th is a Friday. The first training session, actually the pre-session, starts at 1 o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. And the last session on Friday is over at noon. It's about a five-hour drive from here, a little over five hours from here to Leavenworth. There is practically no other way to get there other than drive. I am presently signed up to take that training, but if there is anyone else, else on council who would like to take that training, I will certainly give up my spot in order to, for you to do that. 
I don't know whether the, the training is full yet, but it always fills up well in advance of the actual training. So hopefully you'll think about whether you can make it to the Leavenworth for the, uh, for the training. It is, I think, the best training that AWC offers. It's, it's really terrific. The first time you go, you're a little bit shell-shocked, and it goes past you. Uh, the second time, you begin to apprehend the issues. So I just encourage everyone. That's all. Thank you. Joyce? As liaison to the port, I am on a committee that's the port development of the trails uh, from the new property that they've acquired down on the waterfront. And last week, we walked the Hamilton port property, which is in the process of being cleaned up, and looking at the river and what's going to happen there, this is a very, very exciting thing for our city. It's just a magnificent piece of property. And yesterday I went down and picked blackberries and made a pie. <laughs> Latan, do, do you have vanilla ice cream? I can bring it. <laughs> you did that before it was cleaned up? After <laughs> meetings? The blackberries are wonderful there. Okay. Nobody's bothering. We did, uh, a side note on that one, we did just receive uh, a notification from Department of Ecology that the cleanup plan has been approved and it appears that it is now scheduled for September and October yes. of this year. So it'll be, uh, hopefully all that will be completed in there. <laughs> There are additional areas that they're looking at. Uh, they intend to wrap up in those as well. And blackberries will be gone when they clean it up. <laughs> Hopefully not in the cleanup portion, but the port may. Dave? Mr. Mayor, I appreciate your guidance and your admonishment on uh, the conduct of the Budget Committee. And I will tell you that I certainly will abide by the state law. I will also tell you that this is not the place to admonish the council publicly, and I for one do not appreciate it. I hope that in the future you will take these issues up with us as we all take these issues up with you in private before meetings. I don't remember having to bring up a, an issue with you in public. We do it beforehand. And often we do it with the staff to, in order to uh, be considerate of your time. Because the, mayor, the job of mayor is part-time. We all know that's a fallacy. I look forward to working with you, but uh, if we're going to continue to work together, I think we're going to have to do it a little differently than we did it tonight. Thank you. I'd like to comment Dave, on that. Dave, I certainly appreciate your comments. I believe through this whole process, this staff and this administration has tried to caution the council on how to proceed on these multiple times. And again, if our understanding is correct, and it certainly has not been disputed, 10 days ago you held a meeting that went a different direction than what that council has been. We can wait and do stuff behind the scenes. We can do all of those things. I appreciate that at times different people appreciate the person sitting in the mayor's seat. But at the end of the day, I am here to do whatever it takes to safeguard the best interests of this city. And that includes actions when they are inappropriate. And I will bring them up in public when bringing them up privately multiple times has not proved successful. The council was, in fact, responding to a request from your office for input at a meeting later that day, and that was our only opportunity to do that, and we did it. Obviously, we need, need to take another look at this, but I have not heard one single word from you about this subject, and you're talking about a meeting that took place 10 days ago. Dave, again, at some point, hopefully, your city clerk will get minutes of your meetings. We don't get them. I was absolutely shocked and astonished when Councilmember Greenlee made that announcement during our meeting on Friday. That was the first opportunity I had. 
Now, if you would like to let me know how I am to read minds, you have most of these meetings off-site. Staff are not there. I'm not there. You're on your own. That is why we have cautioned so many times, and I believe that's probably why Municipal Research and a few other people have said that is really odd to have those type of meetings. That just, we're not saying it's wrong. That's just very, very different. And we have tried to be as responsive as we can be, but again, we cannot stop you from the discussions you're going to have. The most we can do is to continue to ask you to abide by the restrictions that the Attorney General and Municipal Research has said you should follow. I wish that the answer was something different, but it's not. I believe the four or five things that Mrs. Forsberg <coughs> put out in her email are pretty darn clear. They don't seem to be very ambiguous. And I don't have any problem with them. I don't think they're ambiguous at all. And this is the first time I've seen this email. I'm sure it showed up in my box at some point, but I have four email addresses and I check over 100 email address or messages a day, seven days a week. So I may have missed this one. But uh, again, if we want to have a decent working relationship, the public reprimand is not the way to go. <clears throat> the meeting 10 days ago was here in the council chambers and David Scott came in and we had an extremely productive meeting talking about the budget. It, the meetings are open, anybody can attend. When Including the staff and the mayor. Anybody it's not by invitation to the staff or the mayor, it's, it's, it's open, open to them, meetings. that's what I wanted to say a moment anybody ago. Anybody can be there. And I think we very carefully have tried to keep all conversations around the budget. Except one. The goal of the budget meetings is to give the council a chance to, dis to discuss budget issues, something that we don't usually do except here in public session, which limits our time. And. Uh, it, it limits the ability of each, each council member to have the time to ask the questions. We, we conduct a very, very informal budget meeting where we, we build off of each other's ideas. And it's very, very beneficial for the council. I don't think that the council up to this point in the, in the entire time that the city council has existed in this city has done its job of advising you of what the priorities are that the council is looking for in the budget that we must approve. We're taking steps to, to remedy that. We want to be a better partner for you for the administration. And that's the goal. If we err if we erred in the way we've uh, proceeded on that, we can correct that. We please don't take the rest of the message wrong. We appreciate and we want a council that is informed and that is engaged in the budget process. Your budget meetings are legal meetings. You just need to be very cautious about what is discussed in those or more importantly, what is not discussed in those. And that's what we're asking again. Well, um, Councilmember Greenlee showed me a statute and it says final disposition. And I, don't, I actually, I'm not even gonna say anymore. It's your job, not mine. Again, if any council members have questions about any of this, please let Mrs. Forsberg or Don English know. The information that we're going off of is from municipal, municipal research, which those of you that have been in the training are pretty much all attorneys, and from the writings of the Attorney General's office. At an administrative level, we're not gonna pretend that we are smarter than those folks who have written those opinions we're going to try and heed their advice. We certainly do on a daily basis within the walls. Attorney Joe. At the meeting on Friday, as we were proceeding in the conversation, I asked the chair if we should be discussing this, aren't we supposed to stick with just the budget? And... Um, Can I inter interrupt one quick second? Sure. Do you have a chairman? Yes. Who is it? Paul. And the chair told us that it was okay. Now, 
I take responsibility for accepting the word over what we'd been instructed. It's, uh, what was the, the comment you made that um, ignorance is not bliss in this case. Um, his answer seemed um, logical, so I took it at face value. Secondly, I see that it says here that notes must be taken and given to the city clerk. I'm under the impression that that's been happening after every budget meeting and that's something that the budget committee will address immediately and see to it that some form of minutes are turned in. There, therein was my question if you even have a chair. I've, we've seen nothing that well, indicates that's, that any of Well, that's unfortunate and I was not aware of that. I don't think the budget committee is aware of that. That will be rectified. Um, I, I, let me apologize to the council. I think the meetings were set on Friday in part to deal with the time <coughs> I could be available, but I've had to work on some Fridays and also other Fridays I've, I take a trip once in a while, as everybody knows. Um, but I remember one meeting where we did have a quorum. I think I've only been to one or maybe two meetings where there was a quorum and we made a decision to tape the meetings, um, I believe, at that they Eden. are all taped, so there oh. are minutes available. Are, have they all been taped? Yes. Have they been turned over to the city administration? No, I still have them. Well, I think they need to be. Okay. They should be done immediately following before the next meeting comes. Even even the non-quorum meetings have been taped. And we have asked for those to be turned in as well, and we've gotten no response. Thank so. you for that information. That has to be rectified. Any items other than that? Yes, right? thank you. What was it? Oh, last Friday night, an excellent meeting was held at the uh, county commissioner's office. It was televised by uh, CVTV, so you have the, the opportunity to go view the East County Bridge meeting. It's being, cons it's being, the can is being kicked down the road that we might consider a bridge here on this end of town. FIG designer, I don't know their exact name, FIG engineering, I'm not positive. Outstanding presentation. She and another company, PCL, which are the bridge builders out here on the west coast that they work with, made that presentation. I would encourage you to go and observe that in the archives of uh, CVTV. And um, we'll just see where we go from there. Thank you. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this before. I just wanted to notify Mayor and Council that I will be absent on the 11th and uh, 25th of August meetings. It was before I even, this trip was planned six months ago before I even knew there was a position available or interviewed. So I'm hoping that they'll be excused. And on the 25th of August, I will be available for any kind of um, phone conferencing. Uh, but the 11th, I'll be in transit, so unavailable. Sure. Thank Great. you. Okay. With that, we will adjourn into executive session in regards to property acquisition. I believe we anticipate action to follow. No action to follow. No action to follow. 15 minutes. Yes. <coughs>